So for the foreseeable future, um, my intros are going to be a little bit different. I usually like to be talking in front of the piece I'm working on so you have a visual of what the video is going to be about. But as of right now, I'm already a couple weeks, in real time, a couple weeks ahead of what is being posted. And to be perfectly honest, I just forget to film the intros before the piece is no longer in my shop. So I'm still gonna make the intros, I just won't be, the piece I'm working on will, will already be in its new forever home. So um, also with this project, I'm gonna be using the exact same intro. So if you're watching both parts, um, kind of like my last videos on projects so that I have various points I want to get across. There's really no point in making two two separate intros. So this project is a little bit different than, than how I usually work. Um, someone who watches the channel approached me about gifting me with a vise. The vise is actually right here. It's a really nice old style Wilton vise. I'd actually used these before. They usually come out of schools and um, it's just so much better than the vice I was using that I complain about that I got off of Amazon for like 30 bucks. Um, not only is this more solid, it doesn't move at all. It's attached to the table real well, but it opens to about seven inches, whereas this one didn't even get past three. So this is going to be just a huge lifesaver in the shop. Now, like I said, he originally offered to gift it to me and I don't like uh, getting things for free. So after a little bit of an email correspondence, he came up with a really cool ideal that he would give me the vice and I would make him a surprise for his uh, young granddaughter. So that is honestly my most favorite way to work. I absolutely love working via barter. Um, I would love to do it all the time. Uh, I post a lot of making gifts and stuff on this channel because I enjoy doing it. Unfortunately, um, I do have bills to pay, so I can't afford to do it all the time, but I do absolutely love working that way. So as you'll, the thumbnail is most likely going to be a picture of the toboggan. So that is what I decided to make. So the reason I came to, to thinking of a toboggan is I wanted something that was aesthetically appealing, um, a challenge to make. I don't like making the same thing twice. I've always wanted to make a toboggan. But I wanted to make something that she can use for a while. I didn't want it to her to outgrow it. So the toboggan itself is, is, is sized more towards uh, for fitting a child. But if I really wanted to, I, I, could, I could have rode it. Um, and I've always wanted to make one. I just think they look really cool. And I absolutely love steam bending wood. I don't really have an excuse to do that a lot. So any excuse I could find, find, um, I will use it. So that is what this video is going to entail. It's going to be two parts. The first part is going to be um, steam bending all the lumber uh, that the video will actually end on all the lumber drying in the jig. And I have a more comprehensive video on how I made my steam box and how uh, the, the, the specifics of steam bending wood on my channel. So I'm going to go through it pretty fast in this video. If you're interested in more in-depth explanation on steam bending, I do have a video like that on my channel. And then the second video is going to be um, putting it all together in, in the finish. So, so that is what these two parts are going to be. So like I showed in the last video, I already showed this clip, but I epoxied all those knot holes and hairline cracks just so that when I started taking this off the jig, I didn't have to worry about anything potentially cracking. Even though it wasn't most likely going to be an issue, I just wanted to make sure I got that done. So then after a couple weeks, I took this out of the jig. I let it dry extra long just to be on the safe side. And what I wanted to mention in the other videos, I talked about bending wood that had knots and, and wasn't up had straight grain or anything like I mentioned in my comprehensive steam vetting video and the reason I believe that this worked out is just because the pieces are so thin so it's much easier to steam if I had done this with thicker lumber inch lumber two inch lumber like I did on the oak chair I made um, the all I think almost every single one of these would have failed now this is how I cleaned up the edges because they weren't totally perfect. This looks unsafe, but this lumber is really thin. It's like a quarter of an inch. So that blade's only exposed a little bit. And I use my tall fence as um, kind of a safeguard on the other side to send this through just to even up those edges. If you, had, uh, if you have a jointer, it probably would be easiest to do it that way. 
but this was actually pretty simple to do. I just curled it on that piece and, and evened up those edges. Mostly where the knots are is where the wood kind of bowed out a little bit. And then I went through and did an initial sanding. This is 80 grit, just sanding down all of that, all of that epoxy. So to start this initial um, top brace on the toboggan, that's what I'm calling it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are technical terms for all these pieces. I couldn't easily find them on the internet, so I'm just kind of using my own lingo at this point. But to start this, this, this initial brace that's going to hold all the slats at the edge of the curve, I just had a scrap piece of oak laying around and I cut um, a groove through the center. There was a reason at the time I did not use my dado stack for this and honestly it's escaping me so that's why I'm making single cuts. And then I'm just making sure all the slats fit. It might have been because the slats are a little bit of a different thickness so if I went through and cut the quarter inch it wouldn't necessarily have been the right size. So I crept up on it with, with the um, the single thickness of the dado blade and then just made sure everything fit in there. And that is basically what it looks like at this point. So then I went through and I got it so there are no gaps. You could kind of follow highlights and shadows and you could see that there's a gap and then where there isn't a gap I would just take this down and plane it just a little bit with a hand plane until I got it where it was just about perfect and then I numbered all of them. I went up top and about an inch and a half back. I drew a straight line and then I centered that mark for all of the holes that I'm going to through drill um, through this piece. Um, before I did that, I just kind of uh, started to round off the edges and all that, especially something for, for kids. You don't want any sharp edges or, or places to get splinters. So I just took a hand plane and then also rounded off all the corners. This is probably easier to do with a router, but I already had the hand plane laying around. And then I could drill these holes. These are quarter inch holes. And the hardware I wanted to use for this, I didn't have in the shop, so I ordered some. So to start this, just so I could start building it, um, I'm using quarter inch bolts and then I'll switch them out afterwards. Um, I had some red dye stain laying around the shop. This is from a very old project and I'm pretty sure that as long as you put stripes on something and paint those stripes red, it automatically means that this is going to go super fast. So that was the, the reason for putting that on there. I also kind of highlighted that top bar just to break up a little bit of the, the oak and then I could slide everything back into place. You could also see I put eye bolts on the underside. I did not film that at this point. That was pretty simple. I just had some laying around the shop and I, I, I um, attached those on the edges. That's where the chain is going to go. So then I could go through which each slat and I could, um, those quarter inch bolts go all the way through that top brace, but they don't go through the slats yet. So I could slide each slat in place drill through the holes I have which will go through the slat and then I could just put a, a temporary bolt in there to hold everything in place. That's how I got all of these all of these to line up and fit into place. You can see I'm just going down the line to make sure they all, all line up and, and stay pretty tight with each other. So then for the rest of the bracing to hold the slats together I had some cherry laying around so I just cut this into rough pieces and that is what I'm going to use for those. Um, before I attach these, I put a quarter inch, this actually might be more of three eighths inch hole on the side. The rope is going to run through this and it's just easier to do it before attaching it to the piece. I use stainless steel screws for these because I'm assuming that this is going to be in the snow and uh, the stainless steel screws will not rust. So then I just lined up all the slats, pre-drilled some holes because this is going through thin oak, you don't want it to split, and then into the cherry and that's how I attached the first brace on the bottom there. So I put chain on that, that first brace going from the top to the bottom in order to get that chain the right size. You can see I have a piece of rope threaded through all those, those um, eye hooks and I could have the the rope in place while setting up the chain. The chain I had for this was a little thin. I end up swapping it out later with the same style chain. It's just a little thicker, but for now this this worked. I should just pull that down and get it into place. And then I can remove the rope and that's how I that's how I got the chain in place. 
Now at this point, because I put the top brace on and the bottom brace on, I started to get some undulations in the piece. You'll see it after after this, this part goes on and I end up fixing it because I just didn't like the way it looks. This is um, a bumper that I'm putting on the front of the sled. It's the same thing, it's cherry. I'm just drilling quarter inch holes through both pieces so they're exactly the same. So then I could clamp it onto my piece and the drill will follow those quarter inch holes and I could drill through, through the front and then you could see I could put the back piece right on. So I did that on both edges and then I was able to go through and drill all those holes so they lined up perfectly. Um, at this point you could kind of see what I'm talking about with there was the 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 way I the, the order of operations I took to put this together made it so that that front curve was starting to not line up anymore. If I was to do this again, I would put this part on first, that middle brace. As you could see I have it clamped in place, and I took that top off, and this is what happened. The differences after putting that middle brace on. So I just went through and I recut these and then I redid the quarter inch holes and it, it evened out that front brace. Like I said, if I was to do this again, I think if I put that bumper bar in first and then the top and the bottom brace, everything would have stayed aligned a little bit better. It was the process of putting on that top brace, putting on the bottom brace, and the bottom brace um, just kind of left everything a little uneven. So this was a nice quick fix and ended up looking really nice once I was done. Unfortunately, because everything shifted, you could see those, my initial set of screws was a little off as well. Luckily, it's on the bottom of the piece and you won't really see it. And then I could go through and I add two more braces on the underside of this. So this is the middle one. Same process, just pre-drilling some holes and putting those stainless steel screws in and then the one in the back as well. So that has three braces on the bottom and then the bumper bar. The nice thing about the bumper bar too was it, it happened to line up right where the majority of the knots were in this so I felt really good about adding a bracing around those knots and then since the pieces are a little uneven at this part I could just trim off the back. So then this is what the dry fit of everything looks like. I think that, that at this point that is the thicker chain that I have in place. And you can see the curve just looks really nice compared to what it was before I fixed it. And that's all with the temporary hardware in. So then um, I did another coat of epoxy on everything just to fill all the holes. Most of the ones I had to do were places where it was laying on the jig and, up, and where I couldn't see it. Then I just went through and rounded off all of my pieces. And then I had, uh, my camera died while I was putting this finish on, but this is the finish I was using. It's a spar varnish from Rust-Oleum. Um, if there's a boat on your, your can of finish, that's usually a pretty good sign that, it, that it's, it's fairly water resistant. Then these are the, the, the bolts I ended up getting. They're called multiple things. I believe on Amazon, these specific ones were called binding posts and they were a little bit thicker than a quarter of an inch so I had to go through and, and drill the holes but I chose these because they're going to clamp the piece together and they're, they're, um, they don't stick up a ton off the piece so I, will, I didn't want to worry about her catching mittens or anything on them they're very low profile and they look nice they look much nicer than, than the thick thick, uh, thick bolts I had there before for the rope I put another mm. uh, screw in the corner I filmed this but I somehow lost the, the footage and I just wrapped that rope around the screw and epoxied it in place and then ran a rope through through the holes I had on the bottom. And that's how I finished it up. So this got about I think four coats of finish I put on there and that was pretty much, much the, the finished piece.